I'm Scott Wheeler. I'm here with my excellent classmates, Paul Salerni and Greg Hayes. Welcome, and thanks for coming to see our little program. I've volunteered to be the manager at the Metropolitan Opera who gets booed to come out to announce that someone's sick and won't be performing. Uh, as in your program, Jessica Bowers, she's a terrific mezzo-soprano, as you will hear, uh, but not in person today. Uh, Jessica uh, has been singing with her husband, guitarist, Oren Fader, so many concerts and recording sessions in New York in the past couple of weeks that she emailed us the other day to say she'd completely lost her voice, and so she stayed home to recuperate. Uh, at the Met, they announced the name of the cover singer at this point. In this case, the backup plan is that Jessica and Oren will appear on video. Uh, I'll turn this over to Paul Salerni to introduce those two performers and his gorgeous songs. Yeah, let, let me reiterate what, what Scott said. That it really is a great pleasure to be here on this stage that birthed our lives as musicians and composers and to be collaborating with Scott, who I've kept up with through graduate school and through our careers, and with Greg Hayes, who was my roommate and, and just the most wonderful pianist and friend. Um, Amherst con continues to inspire and nurture me. Uh, a few years ago, I was reading the alumni magazine, and uh, there, I found an article about David Ferry, class of 46, who eventually went and got a PhD at Harvard, and then became a, a quite well-known and respected poet and translator, and I had never read any of, any of his poems, and given our our similar educational background, I decided to go read his poems, and I did that and fell in love with them, and it, because I had just started to work with the two aforementioned wonderful artists, Jessica Bowers and Norman Fader, I said, why don't I write some pieces for them? So I wrote four songs, and I said, uh-oh, it's time to, to talk to the poet to make sure I have permission to do this, because you, know, you can't just go take someone's words and use them without permission. So I called David and, and he got on the phone with me and he was extremely gracious and he said, well, you're, you're, you're quite astute. You, you, you've kind of chosen the four pieces you've already set. One, two of them deal with identity and then the, the, the other two are ekphrastic. And I went into a total panic because despite my wonderful Amherst education, I did not know what ekphrastic meant. So I, I ran to the dictionary and discovered that it, it is a, a, a type of poetry that reacts to an image or a painting or a photograph and either describes that image or tells a story derived from that. And so once I discovered that, I asked David to suggest stuff because it, it, clearly these were two slightly different kinds of poems and it would be very nice to write a, a cycle on that was ekphrastic and then a cycle that had to do with identity, and I did indeed do that. So the first thing we're gonna, I'm gonna play for you today is uh, one song from Ekphrastic Songs. Uh, it's a song called Civilization and Discontents, and the, what you need to know about that is that the, the, the painting is by Watto. It actually was an engraving from a painting by Watto that I believe David saw at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Watto is a famous 18th century French painter. And another character appears in the poem, his name is Floigel. Floigel was a Flemish painter, but he lived in Paris and he was actually the president of the academy. And he was Watteau's landlord. Now, history says that they were friends, but my guess is they may have been rivals. And you will see that in the poem, there may be a little bit of, of, of um, tension between them. I don't know if it's tension. And one wonders whether David was thinking of other poets who might be amorous poets who were also better known than he was. Um, this, the second two poems are about identity. Uh, one is called What is It? Who is It? And it's about our binary natures. Um, and then the, the third is a, a translation of a Goethe poem called Roman Elegy Number no. 8. And uh, David is very, very well known as, as a translator, not necessarily of German poetry, but of classical poetry just finished a, 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 uh, a translation of the Aeneid. Uh, um, and otherwise, this is Jessica Bowers and, and Oren Fader. 
one of the things that I discovered going to the wonderful presentations on Wilbur and Frost, poets, both of whom I've set to music at some point, is that Amherst does a great job of close reading poetry. And I like to think of my songs as kind of a close translation of the, the emotional or the imagistic content of a poem. So I hope this works. And maybe we could bring the lights down a bit. So that, the other scary thing about this is that live performance is what we composers thrive on. But these days, you can't live without seeing stuff on YouTube. So everything you're going to see is coming from YouTube. It's something we might want to talk about later. It. This is from a live performance at the Tenery Cultural Institute uh, last October 13th. And what you're really going to miss today was that that was also the premiere of Scott's Italian songs, Canzoni Italiani, which are gorgeous, gorgeous pieces. And we would have heard if they could have been here. But they'll come out on CD. When they come out, you'll all buy it. Uh, so this is about binary identity. Here is my picture of myself. Two voices I hear. Both of them mine. Yes, one of them telling the truth. Yes, I have no choice. Yes, telling the truth. The voice, the voice that said what 
Yeah. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, and this is the actual, the, this is the song that follows this. It's a, it's a cycle of four songs, and this is the final song. And this is about a different kind of growing into identity, a, a very awkward child growing into a, what is described as a beautiful fruit later in life. Here is my picture of myself. Two voices I hear, both of them mine. Sorry about that. You already heard that one. There we go. When you tell. So I got really enamored of this idea of combining uh, or, or ekphrastic things, ekphrastic poems. And I was searching around for more ekphrastic poems to set to music. And I luckily was sitting at the table at the organic farm that is run by my sister-in-law in Argyle, New York. And on, on the table was a book called Something Permanent, which is a, a unique book and that on one part of a page there's a uh, Walker Evans po uh, photograph from the Depression and on the other is a poem by Cynthia Ryland that reacts to the photograph by Walker Evans. Well, I think those of us who have kids might remember that Cynthia Ryland is best known as a, as a children's uh, book author but these are very adult poems and uh, I said seven of them, I'm going to play three for you. The first one is called Minstrels. Uh, and it kind of reacts to how people, African-American people who are forced into this quite demeaning stuff might think during this. Um, and the music I chose for that is, is kind of rag in infected because it's, it might be exactly the music you might hear in a minstrel show. The second one is called Boys and it, uh, it's, a, it's a poem about two boys who are fantasizing about an older woman on a warm summer night. And the, the, the music that occurred to me there was the, the Beach Boys in my room. And I used a harmonic pattern for that. And then finally, uh, there's something called Apartment. And Apartment's about someone who comes up from the South and uh, lives by the, the sounds of the subway. So you hear the kind of train sound from, from, uh, from the guitar player. And also, the, the train is how you would get up from the South. I actually pictured this woman as African-American, but you will see in, 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 the, in the photo that it's a white woman. Uh, and they're just a touch of Vivaldi t at one point and a touch of a tango at another point, but otherwise the, the music comes from the blues.
and bring on our classmate and friend Greg Hayes, who's going to join me. We're going to do a little bit of live music here. Um, uh, I'm, uh, Greg and I are going to play a little piece called Cliff Walk by myself. Cliff Walk was a 2006 commission from a British cabaret pianist and singer named Courtney Kenny, who premiered it at the Wigmore Hall in London. The title is a, is a reference to the Cliff Walk in Newport, Rhode Island, where I first met Courtney. The music's perhaps something like a cakewalk, or it's also related to the stride piano of James P. Johnson. In 2011, I made this arrangement for four-hand piano for a Russian-American pianist named Olga Vinokur, who premiered it with David Kalhus, her, her piano partner, at Barge Music in Brooklyn. But I wasn't there, so this is the first time I've played the piece in this four-hand version, or even heard it.
<laughs> okay. So Scott and I spend a lot of time setting words to music. Um, lots of art songs, so you heard six art songs of mine, and I'm encouraging you. There's an entire Naxo CD with your art songs for piano, which is beautiful. And um, the other thing that we've done is in setting words and telling stories is to write operas. Um, and in 2004, my first opera got done. Uh, it's called the Tony Cruz's Final Broadcast. It's a one-act opera, and it got played around, and I figured that I needed a companion piece to go with it because normally in operatic productions, if you have one acts, you put two together and you make an evening like Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci Cabin Pag is a standard thing to do in opera houses. So I was looking for something and I was looking for a comedy and I just couldn't find anything. One night, my wife Laura Johnson and I were doing what we do almost every night, which is to watch the Dick Van Dyke show. We have the entire Dick Van Dyke show on, on DVD. And Laura, who is always smart about everything, and, and when, when she says to do something artistically, I do it, uh, said we were watching The Life and Love of Joe Coogan, which is an episode in season three of The Dick Van Dyke Show, and she said, there's your second one act. It had lots of things in common in, in terms of content with Tony Crusoe's final broadcast. There's a certain amount of, um, of a spiritual choice involved. There's a certain amount of the, the, the difference between something that is commercial and something that is artistic. There were common themes and there could be common roles be, between the characters in the opera. So I said, sure, that's a great idea. It's, it's an episode I absolutely love. When I was, I grew up Catholic and, uh, and until fourth grade, I wanted to be the first American Pope. And, and, and actually the choice that's made is that uh, the character Joe Coogan, and this is kind of spoiler alert, is actually a priest. Uh, so what I had to do to actually get this was to f get permission to use, use the episode and then decide how to use the episode when, when I got it. And um, after searching around, I discovered I had to call the William Morris Agency and talk to Carl Reiner's agent. I did that and I, I said I, I wanted permission for Mr. Reiner to, to take his screenplay and adapt it into an opera. She said, I'll talk to him. She got back to me. She said, Mr. Reiner would like to talk to you. I said, oh, wonderful. And Carl Reiner is one of my great heroes. And she said, I have to warn you, Carl Reiner is the nicest man in the entire world. So I, he called me and we chatted for 45 minutes and he said, as long as you write a high C for the tenor, I give you permission. So when I... Uh, when I uh, had my uh, first opera premiered in Los Angeles, he surreptitiously, incognito, came, and at the end of it, and I think he was pleased by it, he said to Laura and myself, well, would you like to come over tomorrow afternoon to my house and play me what you've written so far on our opera, which I did, and that was about the best afternoon I ever spent in my life, being in the living room of Carl Reiner sitting in Mel Brooks' seat where he sits every night. Anyway, the challenge... The <laughs> Enough anecdotes. The, the, the challenge in doing this one was the script by Carl Reiner, who's a brilliant comedic genius, was what do you do with it to make it opera? And so I fought a lot with the librettist, a wonderfully talented poet violinist uh, named Kate Light. And what we decided to do was to use every word of Carl Reiner's script and somehow find a musical way, either by just having it spoken as in a musical or having it sung to tell the story in Carl's words, but for set pieces, normally in opera, you, you stop the action and comment on something. So she kind of wrote the set pieces and we used Carl for all of the other stuff to tell the story. So I'm gonna play you two clips. Um, the, the story of the opera is that Rob goes out golfing with Buddy and Mel and they, they meet a fourth Joe Coogan and having coffee with Joe Coogan Rob discovers that this particular man, who he hasn't seen in his priestly garb, uh, has written love sonnets to his very wife, Laura Petrie, in a past life. He gets extremely jealous, and he goes home, and he said, how come you never told me about Joe Coogan and the sonnets? And she gets all flustered, and, she, and he says, did you keep the sonnets? Said, yeah, I kept them in the basement, and that's we're, we're going to see that. And then the second clip is uh, Rob goes back to the office, and he's very, very threatened by Joe Coogan, who's very handsome and charming and written love sonnets to his wife, and so he is uh, thinking about writing his own sonnet. 
and uh, Sally and, and Buddy dissuade him from doing that, and it's a, it's a chance for my librettist, who is a wonderful poet, to, to talk about poetry, which seems to me, for me, so far on this reunion weekend, is a bit about all the great Amherst poets. So this is uh, just a short clip from Sonnets in the Basement, which is the second scene in The Life and Love of Joe Coogan. Too nice. <laughs> I forgive you for that. But you have to understand why I thought you read them. I understand that. Well, what don't you understand? I just don't see why a happily married woman has to keep a house full of strange love sonnets hidden down in her basement. They're not hidden in the basement. They're not. I didn't see any show down there. Well, you just not know it's So this is um, uh, Sally and Buddy trying to dissuade Rob from trying to write a sauna and trying to compete with Joe Coogan. Um, and my thought, my musical thought here was, um, there are, as far as I remember in, in all the five seasons of Dick Van Dyke's TV show, uh, there's one very bad rock and roll song called The Twizzle, but there's another one called Buffkiss, which we discover, discover. I don't know, anybody know the Buffkiss episode? It's an episode about someone who's actually stolen this piece, but it was a piece that Rob wrote with another, with a librettist, or, or actually a, a composer, while he was in, in, in the army. And Buffkiss, of course, in Yiddish means what? Nothing, right. But it's a little rock and roll tune that appears, and so that I was kind of trying, trying to channel it in this particular piece. Turns up, Joe. If he thinks it fancies, can't be taking chances. Oh my gosh, I've got it. Got it right, I'm sorry.
Uh, so today is somewhat about who's missing. Um, in uh, 2004, our classmate Steve Scheinman bought a new house in Syracuse, New York, where he was working. And he was so kind as to ask my son Dominic, who's a wonderful violinist, and myself to inaugurate his new piano. I had to give a recital for his friends in a kind of salon-like setting. And I thought I would honor that occasion by writing a piece for, for him. And, you know, I know Steve very well and have just maintained a wonderful relationship. We've traveled in Europe together as, as couples. And uh, he's very loyal about coming to my concerts. Um, and I know that when he was the dean of the medical school at upstate New York, that he often had uh, um, social time with Hillary Clinton, who was the senator then. And I don't know if you know Steve, but when he goes to work, he always wears a bow tie. And so Hillary Clinton's nickname for him is Dr. Bowtie. So I wrote a violin and, pi violin and piano piece called Bo Dr. Bowtie, and I, because I was almost positive that Steve would be here, and he was signed up to come, that we would play a new forehand version of Dr. Bowtie for him. But he had his first grandson yesterday, so he's, he's home. And we're still going to play Dr. Bowtie. It's a, it's a little waltz. And I'm just thrilled to be playing it with the Craig.
We're going to trade off computers here, and I'm going to do a little uh, uh, opera. And, and did you notice the very politically incorrect <laughs> quote in the middle of there? Nobody got it. Lord, Lord Jeffrey Amherst. <laughs> Hang on a second, guys. I'm setting up. Okay, are we in? Yes, but let me see if I'm getting sound. Yes. Yes, okay, we're going to have sound here. Now I'm going to. Um, explain to you what, what you're looking at and, and listening to. My opera, Naga, was premiered in September 2016, so that's since our last reunion, at the Cutler Majestic Theater in Boston. It was a co-commission from White Snake Projects and Boston Lyric Opera. The librettist is Cerise Jacobs. The designer and director is Michael Counts, uh, including lots of the video imagery that he put together. Costumes are by Zane Philstrom. The conductor is Carolyn Kwan. The opera follows a Chinese folk character named Madame Whitesnake, who is an immortal snake demon, and her companion, Chao Ching, the green snake. Madame Whitesnake falls in love with a mortal monk and decides to follow him and lose her magic powers. And as usual in fairy tales of this sort, it's a choice that has bad consequences. Um, the first excerpt. I'll show three short excerpts. The first one is the opening of Act One, which follows a choral prelude. The monk, sung by Matthew Worth, is saying farewell to his wife, sung by Sandra Peaks Eddy, because the monk was born to follow his spiritual quest. He says, I, I was born under the white elephant. Um, they're in a peony garden, which is created on video. The white snake and green snake observe this farewell. You start with them watching, going across the stage, the white snake and green snake.
meeting you was my blessing, loving you my sin. Forgive me, my wife, for my sin of loving you. Forgive me, my wife, for my sin of leaving you. I must continue my journey. And I'll just put it out there. Etc. So, um, second excerpt. Here we are. Um, this uh, the librettist told me that her first title for this this piece was Renunciation. And I don't know what the last term will be on this one. Um, I'll put that on this. And you'll see that they do renounce. Each of them renounces something. The second scene, Madame Whitesnake has decided to follow the monk, saying, I renounce all that I am. The green snake who loved Madame Whitesnake in a previous life as a mortal man and became a snake demon to stay with her, says, I renounced all that I was. Stoprano Stacy Tappan is the white snake countertenor. Anthony Roth Costanzo is the green snake in this excerpt. <laughs> That's uh, another excerpt. Now the last, the last one to show you. Um, the in the following, in following the monk, Madame White Snake gets into a battle with demon rats. This is a total fantasy opera uh, adventure, and she's injured and bleeds on the snow. The monk can't see her, but he's enchanted by her blood on the snow, which he compares to red peonies. This trio ends Act One. The monk sings to the blood peonies. Madame Whitesnake sings of her love for him and the green snake of his love for her. The children's chorus sings from off stage and at the end, the video above the set shows that the monk remembers the wife he just said farewell to. I 
Thank you. Hey, that's it. That's what we have.